Both of this talk is going to be on the um, And in part, it's going to be based on the uh, trip that we made, my wife and I, uh, to Charleston a couple years ago. We had a great time. We had a beautiful museum. And then I'm going to kind of explain some of the myths and mysteries of the home. First, hopefully this is going to work. <laughs> Talking about high tech. How many of you have seen the movie? Uh, uh, Numbers is the smallest. Successful captains of the Titanic. <laughs> Recent Bears Super Bowl MVPs. <laughs> Honest Illinois governors. <laughs> or the post war reunion of the Confederate Submarine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> D, there actually were a whole bunch of survivors. There were. The guys have been on the Hunley earlier. So it wasn't a completely suicide thing. Uh, it just appears that way. Well, history summaries, uh, they go back a long way. This is an old depiction of Alexander the Great in 331 BC, uh, being lowered in the glass submersible. Uh, maybe Alexander the Greek who was a little Muslim there, but I mean, uh, the idea is that at the siege of Tyre, they were building a number of water dike to reach the, the town, and he actually, they actually had diving bells, essentially, uh, to um, reach these things. 
The seed to serve these ladies, Douglas. But these are more legendary things. The first early stumps are actually fairly well known, not very successful. On the left here, this is the David Bushnell submarine. It's trying to talk in the Revolutionary War. Now, basically, the problem with submarines in those days was two propulsion and cable explosion. The difficulty was if you're underwater, you don't have air. And the ready source of air, and of course, air, oxygen is what fuels engines, including steam engines. You gotta have it. So originally they went with hand cranking, and that was Bushman's idea. He was a one man submarine attacking the British Navy in the New York Harbor in 1776. He actually went underneath a British warship. And he had a screw here that he was going to screw, go through the wood here and attach a screw there and put a bomb on and then get away hopefully before it exploded. The attack failed because the ship turned out to be sheathed with copper on the body. So he didn't get a screw to get through the copper. On the right is Robert Fulton. Robert Fulton is better known for inventing the uh, steam perspective, the steamship. But here is his uh, Nautilus, as he called it. And he started the term torpedo. He had an invasive as far as explosive as his, as his method of destroying ships. And a torpedo fish, as you might know, is a fish that stuns its prey by shooting out an electric shock. And so he called his explosive device there a torpedo. On the surface, it was a sailing ship. He tried to sell it to the French government. And Napoleon said, Yeah, I'm sort of busy conquering Europe. You know, so I was like, Worry about something instead of going like that. Um, the explosive problem was solved later by a guy, an Englishman named Robert Whitehead. He was hired by the Austro Hungarian Navy, yes, there was Austro. And he invented the first self propelled, self guided torpedo, the kind that we know today. He used the gyroscopic stabilizer or something to keep it going more or less on course. Um, how many of you watch The Sound of Music? Remember the Von Trapp family? Baron Von Trapp was Whitehead's grand grandson. And that's where he got all the money for all the chateaus. <laughs> the first practical ship that was sunk by a self propelled torpedo was 1877 in a Chilean civil war. Uh, not, but, you know, not exactly front page news in the United States, but it showed that it could be done. In 1897, an American inventor named John Holland solved the problem of propulsion. Basically, he said, well, let's have two engines. On the surface, we have a regular steam or gasoline engine. Below water, we're going to put batteries. They have a battery power. They have batteries powering engines. Batteries don't use oxygen. So with this dual propulsion system, sort of like a hybrid car, by the way, that was the first practical propulsion system for a submarine. Because a submarine could be undetected, but if it can't go very fast, it can't catch any ship. The second There were, in fact, early Civil War attempts. This is a Union submarine, the USS Alligator. Go on with that. Um, the Union Navy was trying to do submarines too. Uh, this is basically a hand cranked submarine, you know, power again. And uh, they had a primitive air scrub system. And by that I mean, you know, when you breathe, you breathe out nitrogen and stuff like that, it poisons the atmosphere eventually. They had uh, some calcium, car calcium, calcium carbonate or something to sort of grab the, the nitrogen out of the air so they could stay under water longer. Um, the alligator was a failure. First of all, because it wasn't fast enough. And second of all, because there weren't a lot of Confederate ships around to sink. 
<laughs> there weren't enough good targets. So uh, they basically gave up on it eventually. But the Confederates were a little more desperate and a little more soft. And here we have the two uh, people who basically built the homeland. The first on the left is the machinist, James McClintock. McClintock was uh, with the New Orleans. He owned the uh, boiler and repair, you know, steam engine repair shop and everything. And he did the practical stuff. Horace Hundley was a local lawyer who had a lot of money. And so Hundley provided the financing for this for the submarine. And McClintock provided the engineering. McClintock's is an interesting story. He survived the war. After the war, he tried to sell the US Army on his own version of the torpedo. Um, he had a demonstration in Boston Harbor in 1870 to blow up a ship, you know, large right across the there. He sent his torpedo out, the torpedo circled around and blew himself up. <laughs> Not a safe way to do things. But Horace Hungry is the guy who owns the eventual submarine in the world. There was, in fact, several submarines before the Hummer. This is the model of the Pioneer. Uh, this me, by the way, uh, uh, this is all the technology. You don't know exactly what's happening. And so they built a, built a submarine and it was weighted the wrong way, so it would go down and it would not always come back up. It would not have been a submarine. Um, it was constructed in New Orleans. The idea was to have it as a privateer. Now, a privateer is something um, it was kind of in the world those days. Basically, if you don't have a navy, you get merchant ships and put a gun on them and say, take any Union vessel you want, and you can sell it and keep the proceeds for yourself. Sort of a private work at that. Well, McClintock and Hungry thought that this submarine would be just great for being a privateer. They could uh, sneak up on a Union warship and sink it, and you know, Confederates would have to pay $100,000 to the French warship, he said. Uh, but of course, they can't have the same difficulties. One of the things happen when the Union when the Union Navy takes the models how many do. The submarine is still not ready, and they have to sink it. <laughs> it was fished out, by the way, and uh, a replica, an early replica, is now on display in the Jackson Square in, in, in downtown New Orleans. <laughs> But yeah, just using the, the, the code here. So uh, I'm giving up it. No more football games around. Usually that's not a problem. They're actually winning this year. Yeah. Uh, well, this is one of the famous drawings of the uh, the Clinton Third Summer. This was built in Mobile after the Union Navy takes over New Orleans. The Clinton and Company transfer their operations to Mobile, Alabama. And they build a submarine there called the uh, Pioneer. It was an improvement. They actually had the idea of having battery power to, to, to propel it. And essentially what John Collins did 40 years later. But the batteries at the time were so weak, they couldn't propel the ship fast enough. So they basically fell back on hand cranks. Mm -hmm. um, Mobile Bay has a lot of currents, a lot of tides, and literally they couldn't even go against the tide. No day, let alone go and hunt down new ships. Well, uh, General Beauregard in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, he was an engineer by training. He was sort of an innovator, always looking for new ideas, and heard about this summer. He said, why don't you ship it to Charleston? And we'll give it a try here. So they brought me. Push this, and they loaded it onto a special train car and did it by train to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, which is where it's going to get its unbelievable thing. In February of 1864, it's going to be the first submarine to ever sink a hostile warship. Though, as we'll see, it wasn't anything as a submarine, it was on the surface. 
the trouble was there was uh, a couple disasters in between. Uh, they quickly began, began testing the Huntley in Charleston Harbor. They turned it over to a Navy lieutenant named John A. By the way, afterwards was the head of the Baseball Association of Alabama. Uh, he took it out for trials, tried to train a crew and everything. And his first attempt, it suddenly sank at the dock. I mean, it was really just more at the dock and went straight down. <laughs> uh, there are conflicting stories of what happened. Some claim that the wake of a passing ship flooded the company's open hatches, filling with enough water to sink it. Others claim that the lines got tangled with the lines of another ship that was being dragged out. Whatever happened, whatever the cause, the family sank and died with his crewman died. Because literally, you can't get out of those wretches. Mm -hmm. Only basically, the guys close to the hatch has a chance to get out. Payne was standing on top of the ship. He jumped and swam to safety. It took weeks to retrieve the something suffering. And in the meantime, Horace Hunley arrives in Charleston and says, I gotta take charge of it. I was familiar with it. And by the way, one of the things about it, it says the Hunley here, the title of the talk was CSS Hunley. There's a lot of legal debate as to whether it was actually a Confederate Navy ship or not, or whether it was just a private venture that was staffed by Confederate Navy personnel. Well, Hunley takes it over and he schedules a demonstration of the boat in Charleston Harbor. So you dive over this, under this boat, come up on the other side. Well, he dived under the boat, he was never seen again. <laughs> A couple weeks later, they had divers, by the way, and uh, the dolphins and rescue people on hunt. <laughs> and what they found was how he had dived the thing too steeply and he stuck the thing right in the mud trip of the bottom of Charles Uh When the hatches were open, there was a gruesome sight as the members with the crew seemed to froze in the time. I'm still coaching at Candles and Forward Contact. Uh, basically, Hunley was not familiar enough with the ship. He couldn't release it, but he didn't know what the, what the right instruction was to release it. They can get it to come back to the surface. So the whole crew died. It was suspected that Hunley mismanaged the pumps and therefore lost his life. You'd think that after two disasters like this, nobody would want to go there again. Well, they found another volunteer, Lieutenant George Dixon. On the left is the only known photo of George Dixon. On the right is a reconstruction from his skeleton that they dug at the Charleston Museum. George Dixon is sort of a man of history. Uh, I've done some research on him to try to help out the friends of the this. What we do know is he was probably Norman, probably from Cincinnati, Ohio. That he was an engineer on a steamboat in Alabama before the war. He volunteers for the 21st Alabama Infantry at the Battle of Shiloh. A bullet hits him right in the hip, which is generally fatal in those days. But what happened was he had a $20 gold piece in his pocket there, given to him by his fiance. And the bullet hit the gold piece and bounced off. And so he was he lived for the rest of his life, but he was otherwise ill and hurt. Well, this disqualifies him for active uh, infantry service. So he decides to, he's very adventurous, he knows machines and knows boats. So he volunteers for the Navy. He was probably well to do. When they unearthed the Hunley, he was dressed in silk shirts. I mean, uh, and his apartment in Mobile had a lot of pretty expensive stuff there. It is thought or suspected that he was had shares of a blockade runner was making profits off of running the blockade also, which a lot of them did, of course. This is the facial reconstructions of the crew. Now, how they do that, you may be familiar with, you know, with this process from some uh, bad TV shows, but uh, 
basically they take the skulls of the victims, they have sort of a calculation of how much skin and flesh you have over particular points of your bones. They put that on, they use the descriptions to try to do the hair color and everything. And this is, we don't have actually photos of any of the group. But it was interesting. A lot of them were northerners or foreigners. Remember, the Navy at that time, uh, both navies, uh, well, you're international, you're sailing from one country to the other. And so a lot of American sailors on the Union vessels were born in Germany or Holland or Sweden or someplace like that. Um, several of them were northerners. And they weren't short. These are actually pretty big guys for the time. I think the average about 5, 10, or 5, 11. The one thing that they saw from that was they all had sore backs. And that's from bending in that thing that turned the ground. So they all had back problems, back and shoulder problems. But uh, otherwise, they're pretty healthy people. And then ranged from age of 18 to 40. So that's a pretty good cross section uh, of the Confederate Navy. Now we get to the fatal night. The Hungley was stationed at Sullivan's Island uh, near Fort Moultrie, by the way. Uh, and uh, they were looking for an opportunity to sink a ship. And the USS Lusitanic was a shallow drafted gunboat. That uh, because it's shallow drafted, it, the idea was as close to the mainland as possible. Because blockade runners quite often were shallower than the warships, and they come right down, you know, use the shallow water where right? the U.S. warships couldn't couldn't get into. Uh, warships had warships, of course, they have a lot of heavy cannon, so they sink lower into the water. Blockade runners don't have that kind of weight, so they can go into shallower waters. They targeted the two satanic. And they went out and sank it. This is a four mile trip. And here's a picture of recreation of the moment of impact. By the way, all that idea about the torpedoes you know, being dug from inside by a lanyard or something like that. No. This was a pole with a contact mine. Uh, with a copper contact fuse. And so once you ran against the ship, it was thrown up. It struck the bad portion of the Lusitanic below the waterline. And in those days, ships didn't have watertight compartments. So the cold and pretty sick. Got a big hole below the waterline and it sank pretty quick. This is a diagram of a hungry impact. Again, you can see, you know, from the you know, it's passing around here. This is where the uh, mine will be. They get ropes to hold it up like that. Uh, when they weren't in the water, they could pull it out of the water to keep it dry. Um, we'll talk about other things about the ship. But um, this is a Short video on the actual attack and the explosion. Let's see the explosion. This was done by the United States Navy Department a few years ago. Some people have said why that explosion was so great if you found it back out of the hungry and uh, knocked out the crew. Not necessarily so. When you have an explosion like this, and this is part of the US Navy, they have a lot of interest in figuring out how explosions work ships. The explosion goes upwards. The explosive, the expansion of gases follows the line of least resistance. If the explosion went down here, they'd be getting a lot more water and bedrock. Same here, a lot more water. Up. If it goes upward, it's going to eventually hit the air. There's going to be less resistance there. 
So any explosion is going to go up, not out. At least according to the United States Navy. It's pretty interesting. The Huntley disappears after the day. And people literally within three years after the war were working. People tried to look for that book, look for that book. Finally, in 1995, an author of Burma novels in the White House finds an expedition. He writes novels about finding lost treasures and things like that. There, that's what he's doing. There's a lot of customs there. And he financed a bunch of local archaeologists and divers to try and search for this thing. And they call it an agricultor and found every metal object, metal object basically, Charles Harbor. And they went, in 1984, they had a big expedition, they couldn't find it. No. In 1995, they didn't come back again. They still can't find the home. Until one day, just as they're ending, and uh, you know, the searchers say, well, Custler paid us for another day. We'll do another day out there and see what we can find. They searched something that they found 11 years before and rejected it because they didn't think it was the submarine. They thought it was no wood, which is that now. The reason they didn't examine it very closely was because it was not just far away from the Hungary, but it was out to sea. You think the Hunley after the attack would go back into the harbor? This was completely in the opposite direction, and it just so happened that the first diver goes down there, and he he's scraping mud and everything off the, the wreck, and he finds the time up. I mean, it's a hundred to one shot that he would do that, but once he, once he saw that conning tower, he says, comes up and says, "Hey, we found it." They called Clyde Custler that day, and he couldn't believe. It. Five in the morning. <laughs> they, the finders, per Hustler's instructions, did not tell anybody for a couple of years where it was. Because they figured the wreck, the wreck, until we know how, until they knew how to get it out safely. If you tell people where it is, everybody's going to die down and try and strip it for relics. So they kept it a secret. What they did was they put a little notes there and say, hey, we discovered, they put it inside the common town and said, we discovered this in 1995, you know. So anybody would come in with we would detect that they discovered it. There's the three discoverers right there. And after that, they uh, went to a restaurant in North Charleston for dinner. And there's me at the same table that they eat the same hamburger that they eat. Uh, uh, Less than this picture. Uh, good work, super. Uh, it took a couple of years, I mean, how many grants to raise money. First of all, Cluster kind of told everybody where it was. The state of South Carolina wanted to have it, the United States government wanted to have it because. This is a Confederate warship, and they claim ownership of all United States sunk warships. And three or four other people claim it. There's a lot of, a lot of lawyers, unfortunately, got it. But eventually, they got enough financing done for a museum to put in and a plan to raise them. And here's a little film clip of the raising. This is an animation of it. Once the wreck was found, a tremendous operation involved in government assistance and the best technical engineer in set in motion. To raise the hood. The protection of this nationally significant outside was given high priority by the state of South Carolina. The hundred weighs about 30 tons, so a specially built truss had to be constructed. Large piles were lowered to the bottom. Then the water and silt was pumped out, causing the piles to be sucked into the mud. The truss was then lowered, with each end supported by the pile. A 
serious support strap will look at the roll of that and carefully inflate it to evenly distribute the ship's load. Complete the support. The hull was hoisted aboard the recovery barge. She was then transported to a specially constructed holding tank and will be transferred to the Charleston Museum when restoration is complete. They were very careful about not, not breaking the hull on the uh, They transferred to a holding tank. One of the things about water there is it's salt, salt corrodes. The metal weakens it, and literally they put uh, 10 years soaking the salt out of the metal to restore it to, you know, about as strong as it was uh, that day uh, when it was built. Uh, this, the film club, there are several videos of the film club. There was like 7,000 fighting vessels, you know, sitting around there and cheering them. An arm that breaks the surface. Uh, now, here's the highway today. This is in the Charleston Museum here. Uh, evidently, uh, at the time you were on, it's still being uh, conserved. I understand that the long term idea is put in a glass enclosure with a argon gas inside, a neutral gas that won't react to the metal or anything will preserve it. We had a splendid crew of men at the service. By the way, I don't know the right. Um, yeah. The dogs are on the right. Then. So we should. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Quarters. That's a stick showing how big that hatch is. Or how big the you know, the submarine there. There's you can do the hatch. But through the sides. And you can see I can just barely fit through the hatch. It wasn't you couldn't get through very quickly. It was hand powered. On the left there they have the, the submarine they use for the movie. By the way, in the movie, the, the thing is 20% bigger than the actual submarine. Uh, you guys are just you know, for filming purposes and that sort of thing. On the right, on your right, that's me with the actual. Look at how you have to give in close like it. The benches were angled down. That's because that gives you a better angle, better push. On those cranks. This is the Dixon's gold watch, gold coin and watch. Uh, this is how we really knew that this was the hunter because it had been known that Dixon had this $20 gold piece with an inscription on it, and they found it on him when he found his products. There's this watch again, this is a pretty expensive watch. So this guy is making some money somewhere. The uh, the bodies were found basically in the position to expect when they were in There was no, unlike the, when Hungry went down, you could see the bodies of a friend who clawed without the hatch yet. The bodies were found basically in the action stations. We found the bodies. There was mud all over the inside of the thing, and they used the toothbrush basically to clean out like 30 tons of mud. And that's how long that takes. Other things. This is the keel wood, the lead keel wood. Basically, this is an emergency uh, way to get off the bottom of the, the, of the ocean. They had lead weights on the bottom of the ship 
put the screws on that and from the inside you could unscrew the thing, the lever would fall down, the ship would be light, and there we go back right back up to the surface. Here's the interior of the ship. I mean, uh, you can see it's probably really, really dark. Uh, it's heated and sweaty and 28,000 other things. Not a pleasant way to spend a war. They made discoveries. And the discoveries basically were this something was a lot more sophisticated than I thought. First of all, they had a gear train of flywheel. I don't know if you have any engineers here, but I understand that when you're doing this cranking, uh, you know, you're, you're turning a wheel with, with a weighted wheel that gives you more consistent thinking of the propeller. They had a battery, an electric battery mission, and we do not know exactly why they had this battery. It wasn't for light, probably. What the guess is that they had a backup electric charge to detonate the mine to the contact and they work. It was sleeping, it had counter sunk rivets. By counter sunk rivets means that rather than have a you know, like screw of nails with round tops on it, they're flush with the rest of the submarine, flush with the mid surface. The torpedo was on a spar again. A lot of people thought that this submarine had it on a rope. That was trailing the, 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 the mine. They had it, they died under the ship and then dragged them by. We had that rope on it. No, this was a uh, spot. When they found the ship, it had stalactites inside. And what that means to, I guess, the experts is it, when it sunk, it was dry inside. Stalactites are little, you know, things you see in the cave and that. Uh, when water drips down, it has little metallic things in it. The metallic things uh, plumbing, you know, like an arrow downwards. So the best guess is that this thing was not wet when it went down for the last time. And he had a sheared off rubber. We don't, know, we don't know exactly why the rubber was knocked off. They had eight men rather than nine. The crew was supposed to be nine, but they only had eight on this voyage. Only eight died. They had a snorkel. A snorkel would be the kind of thing for summary. Basically, they have a breathing tube that you go up above the, above the water and grab, grab air and breathe it down and in. They had a snorkel that the Germans basically used in World War II. So this was pretty nice for the time. And the sea cocks were broken. Now, sea cocks are basically they got a, a a little door type thing where you can get the if you want to want to drain the ship and open these things. If you got one on the side, it breaks out. Uh, they were broken. This is the so-called torpedo. Now, again, what we call today a mine, they call that a torpedo. These are not self-propelled. And this is a drawing of the uh, community that the torpedo seemed to look like. And you can see the contact keys there. And this is the spar. And you can see the end of the spar there, the copper sheet and it was blown backwards by the explosion. Which again indicates that the, the mine was right there. Of course, it's In the water. On uh, the left, there's me. Uh, Charleston Harbor in those days was relatively shallow, so it's basically something about 30 feet of water. And so there's me, and you know, you see that line up there, and that's about where the water was. So it wasn't that far below. And there's a marine diver, me, and there's my wife as an RPI concert conservator there. Uh, a little fun there. But what happened to the summer? So these are the basic uh, uh, ideas advanced as to why the Harlem never came to Now, the movie has a suicide death. I don't think any historian believes that, but that's a good movie. 
Yeah, they said, oh, you know, we're just a secret, we're just going to not know. Did the explosion cause home? Did the explosion distort the home and cause leaks? Probably not, because the stalactites indicate that the inside of the thing was basically dry for at least 10 years after the war. Was there a battery acid leak from that battery? Well, maybe some fumes from that battery just knocked them all out. Did it collide with a Union ship? In the movie, Armand Asaki gets shot uh, by a, a shotgun from the Housatonic, you know, goes right to the portal there. Did the concussion from the explosion kill the crew? And then talk a little bit more about that. Did they run out of air due to misjudgment? Broken seat cracks? Originally, they thought that somebody had been sunk, sunk, sunk into the hole of the Musa Tank, but the Musa Tank went out. You know, they thought it was going to be underneath the Musa Tank. Turned out it wasn't. So, what happened? We may never know. The theory of uh, the Duke University the professor came up with this theory a couple of years ago that the concussion. Of the explosion. Now, this explosion is like 30 feet away. And it's 125 pounds of black powder. Her calculation said that this is enough to stun the crew or dump them unconscious. And so, without the crew being conscious and everything, they just sank. The US Navy tested this theory and said, no, that's not true. The explosion might give you a, a black and blue helmet or something like that, but it wouldn't knock the whole crew out. Because the explosion forces go up rather than up. But this is the concussion theory is a very popular one. Trapped by the tides. Remember, this thing only go three or four miles an hour. Charleston Harbor has strong ocean tides. And the idea was they tried to go back into the harbor. They just didn't have the energy after all that effort to get out there to stem the tide, which is blowing out at the time, coming out from the harbor to the sea at the time. It's also possible the crew is just their oxygen supply. Um, probably the theory I like most is that they decided to go the other side of the satanic after they saw it, because that's the way the tide was going. And they would get on the bottom there and wait for a couple hours until the tide would start going back into shore. And then once the tide reversed, they'd get up and come back. But maybe they miscalculated their oxygen supply. They had, they had tested their oxygen supply. They'd gone down for two hours. With no extra reaction, just in that way. They might want to, they might probably even wait two hours. The trouble was when they went down for a practice thing, they weren't sweating at the time. They hadn't, you know, they were they hadn't rolled for four miles. They hadn't had the excitement of battle. And when you have that, you're breathing a lot harder and a lot heavier, and you're consuming more oxygen. So this is probably the theory I I think I get the most is that. They just miscalculated. They went to the other side and decided to wait a couple hours and sneak back when the tide was going the other way. And they miscalculated their, their oxygen supply. Collision at sea, there were stories that uh, one ship, that was, some Union ships were coming to rescue the hungry, bumped into something. There's really no evidence that, uh, substantial evidence that this happened. And there's no evidence from the Hunley that there was a fault that would have caused it to uh, sink. Lucky shot. Well, again, that's Armand assigning the camera telling you that uh, you know, shoot the portal and then you work Armand is not going to have to work this. Yeah. Uh, and then would have put a hole in the, the portal. We had a little glass thing for something to look out on. They broke the glass and then sunk. Again, I don't think that's the case because it was dry for years after the uh, sea. Damage to the sea cots? Well, there was damage to the sea cots. Yeah, but uh, 
Again, the seacock, you know, seacocks would have let water in, and the indication was that the water didn't need to recover. Did the snorkel leak? Oh, here's your snorkel. Just the snorkel box, by the way, before it had the conservation. Uh, pretty primitive stuff. Basically, to get the air into the thing, you get bellows, like you go for uh, you know, an old fashioned waxer shop or something. And you force the air from the surface down there. I'm not sure I want to, you know, depend on that for my life. Uh, but um, if it broke, then it could have been leaking. And the ship could have filled with water just because of that. In some nation, we don't really know definitively why the Hummel was lost. I think some scenarios can be ruled out pretty clearly. Uh, but that still leaves two or three plausible scenarios that they don't simply don't have enough evidence to be able to determine one way or the other. Well, the Hunley crew, after they were uh, examined and everything, they were given a burial in the young cemetery. The big cemetery of Charleston. And they had a big ceremony. They had the horses going through the streets with horse pot, horses and everything. And, uh, this is a brief video of that ceremony. The sons of Confederate veterans were out in force. They crowd like 15,000 people there. Is that the song that they sang at the end of the Titanic? Okay. Yeah. 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 I need to see this is <laughs> this is a lap. So let's go to that one. And the world's there. <laughs> It was, it was done with all the robots, uh, muscular, I guess you'd say. Yeah, just how crazy they were to sacrifice for the place. They're very together, by the way. I'm going to say something. How far do you want to Website keeps you up to date on all the things that are happening. And then there's a book by the by Rachel Lance in the ways is sort of her uh, examination of the explosion. So any one of these books is probably giving you a lot of good information on the Hunley. I don't have the time to give you tonight. Concerns, yes. I've heard this called first successful. Yeah. Yeah. 
the guy. So, uh, so there's a distinction there. Or, you know, yeah. What look what classifies this for success when they come back? Well, because uh, they had yeah, a real small ship, they lost eight men, and they sunk a much bigger ship, and uh, there was a lot more loss of life. Basically, the, you know, in the war, of course, there's no such thing as a victory without casualties. So it's a compare. I think it's a comparative thing of success. If you lose a a thirty ton warship to destroy a fifteen hundred ton warship, that's considered a success. No problem not for the crew. <laughs> No, I would think that like somebody actually looks at the facts and the guy's survived. That's the fact. I have something to do with it. Well, to me, the more interesting thing was it wasn't a submarine at the time, it sunk. It was on the surface. And the Hussatonic sailors said, you know, we had heard about the submarine, it wasn't very good to know about it. And the submarine forced the blockaders to continually steam around and release coal. And you know, knock out their engines basically because of wear. So just having the submarine was a successful competitors. And then, yeah, they knew it was they knew it was there, but they didn't see it until it was like 100 feet away because it's a it was on the surface. But it's just the kind tower. You think it was an old log, basically. Then they saw this old log swimming pushed purposely toward them. They knew it was the submarine. Now, what's the most first successful submarine attack? Uh, Oh boy, probably, probably World War II came back, by the way. And, uh, yeah. I'll say the World War I. There were other attacks by torpedoes, but they were generally surface ships. Again, everybody in the 1890s was trying to get the practical submarine because it was see potential. John Allen was the first one to make it a reality. And Thomas Edison had a big part to do it. He was the one who made the, the new and improved batteries to power those submarines. In fact, Edison, then go to the Edison Museum in Florida. He made more money on batteries than he did on the phonograph or the, you know, the movie theaters or anything like that. That was his big money maker, and that probably had more of an influence than uh, all the entertainment of the thousand other inventions that he made. So, uh, yeah, it, it took it took that kind of technology to make it a practical weapon. Yes. How about the Revolutionary War? Well, that was when I showed you. That was David Bushnell's yeah. submarine. Uh, they, he tried to, again, to get that screw to attach his bomb to the bottom of a British warship, and the screw didn't take because the bottom of the warship was sheathed with copper. They were sheathed with copper at the time, by the way, because you know, it's all wood on the bottom. You get barnacles and worms, and the worms would eat the ship. And quite often, quite often especially in the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, you'd be sailing along and suddenly the bottom of your ship would fall out. <laughs> Not a good thing. <laughs> so that's why they that's why they put copper on the bottom. First of all, to prevent that. Second of all, the barnacles slow down the ship, as you might understand, like, you know, better understand. So having the copper sheathing, the barnacles and you know the oyster shells and everything, they don't like the copper. So it was a good try. Uh, it was very difficult. One man trying to propel that turtle thing. They couldn't go very fast. Um, it was not a practical weapon of war, basically. Uh, it was proven. Even if, even if the bomb had worked properly, it was just too slow to do anything but a surprise attack against the ship. Yeah. 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 He got out of it, yeah. Uh, yeah, he didn't try it again, but he, he, got, he, he returned safely. That's something at least. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't really try more submarines during the Revolutionary War. Not a good idea. Yes? How far from shore was the bomb? Uh, the, the, the voyage was 4.3 miles to Lusitana. It was about 600 yards, I think, to the south and uh, east. Of the Hussatan. So, less than five miles. Uh, 
again, the surprise was no, everybody thought it was uh, would be on the charts inside of the Musa Tata. But they mentioned the blue top end. Oh, there's another thing, the blue light. Everybody know we get blue light. Yeah. That they would get blue signal light. Well, no. The blue light was not a light. You know, the, 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 the thing that they, the, the, they were supposed to, suddenly was supposed to signal with a blue light that way up on the, on the ship, that they had been successful. They were supposed to signal the shore that they had done that. Blue light in those days was fireworks, not a lamp. And nobody remembers seeing fireworks that night. Again, if you show, you set off fireworks in your submarine and sort of <laughs> locates everybody where your submarine is, and you're sitting not so. So the, again, that's one of the myths and legends of the uh, Hummer is that blue light. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, is there any kind of estimate about how long it took them to uh, sail up from uh, the back to the ship? I think we can make a pretty good estimate. Um, probably at least an hour. It's four miles an hour. And this thing is literally just. <laughs> one long set of yeah, that's about it. Because it's 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 heavy, and they made it as sleek as they could. But a human being is an eight horse is a one quarter horsepower engine. So eight people cranking that's a two horsepower engine. That's basically you're you're riding a lawnmower, and that's what's powering this ship. So you can imagine it's not going to go very fast, and won't certainly won't go against the current of any size. So yeah, probably about an hour, a little more maybe. Yes. The immediate aftermath, you said that the, the human recognized the black hit them eventually. When did the South know that it was missing and they become immediately like when they went very immediately or was it something that was over time? Uh, the question is when did the South and the North know about it? Within 24 hours. The North knew about it right away. Well, Charles and I were so shallow when the Pusatonic sank, some of the masts were still above water. And so the sailors just climbed up on the mast and made them down too. So they knew exactly where the thing was and what had happened. And when the Hunley didn't come back after 24 hours, they sort of knew that was never coming. Again, I don't think anybody was really surprised by that. How long did it take uh, as far as the loudness of the explosion, water, I think, transmits sound more than air does. So it would have been a pretty loud explosion. Uh, certainly the other blockading ships were the explosion. And uh, it's 130 pounds of black powder. Now, black powder, again, is an explosive. It's not, it's not used today because it's really slow acting. It uh, takes a half, a quarter of a second to build up. You know, to the expansion of the things that caused damage. Uh, so that it, it was a more drawn out noise and explosion than what you than what you see with a modern explosive. I mean, in case explosive, uh, ammonal or ammonium uh, nitrate or something like that. Yes. Yeah, how could they see what they were doing? Well, you know, they had these little conning towers and they had little glass items, they call them uh, cat, uh, cattails or something like that, where they would uh, be able to see through and get sunlight a little bit. They were on the surface so they could get some air and they could keep a candle to approach the Housatana. But the last 200 yards, obviously, they get to close the hatches and knock out the candles because. Uh, you don't want to light up the night when you're trying to attack a big warship by surprise. Yeah, the difficult, again, today they have electric lights and everything. Not invented until by Thomas Edison in 1970. So, uh, so we have it. They tried, by the way. They thought about having chemical lights, they have phosphorus and things like that. They would, you know, it's a chemical glow, sort of like a, a lightning bulb does. Uh, but they couldn't, they didn't have the chemicals and they couldn't make it practical thing. Uh, so, yeah, they're basically, they're, they're got to take them dark, remember? And so it's 
So it's really dark and it's, you know, the guy can sort of see, sort of see the outline of the ship they're going for. But it's, it's difficult. They tried it several times, by the way, to sink the Susa down before, before the successful one. The Susa time is so much faster that if it moves, they can't catch it. It just had to be exactly the right time. Yes? The alligator was, this is the Union summary we talked about, but the alligator is actually a little bigger than They showed two people there, but they actually had, that was just for demonstration purposes, they actually had more people. And uh, there's also allegations of this French guy who's in the music. <laughs> Believe it or not, there was corruption in the in the Union and the Civil War. I don't believe, I know, but uh, it was bigger. And bigger was not necessarily better because that's more weight you gotta push with your quarter horsepower engine. Eight people, two horsepower engine, that's nothing. Uh one more question, yeah. Well this uh so I I just I missed you were saying about what the plan is for the hungry once it's uh Decomposition was completed. Some kind of glass enclosure, you said? Uh, yes, that was the one I heard about with our guy, which is a uh, yes, that doesn't all buy the metal. Okay, and also then just the timeline. We discovered it in 95 and then brought it up a couple years later, 97. And my wife and I saw it when it was still in the back. That was 2004, early 2004. How long did it stay in that back? Do you know? I think they're over 10 years. Over 10 years. I think so, when they're doing the monitor in the Newport News, they're so it takes 10 or more years to soak the iron uh, mm -hmm. because they got to do it just a little bit at a time. Yeah, it might even be more than 10. Well, where's, the, where's the now? Then it was at the naval yard in a big, you know, big bonds of that town. I think it's pretty much the same place you're talking about. It's a quad, it's an old quad, maybe quads apart from the neighbor that the, the, the U.S. Navy gave to Charles the, 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 house, the house of the house. And last but not least, I know everybody wants to ask this. What's the name of the restaurant? <laughs> Read the book and you'll find out. Yeah. It's in North Charleston. That's the only thing I can tell you offhand. Which book? Uh, the book by uh, Hicks, Sea of Darkness. Yeah, that's, 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 the best, that's the best book on the pump. And it's not working with the pump. Plus, I think it's the best book ever in the world. That's probably the best. Okay, I think we're sort of out of time. We're probably going to throw us out to minutes for this. Thank you. 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 Thank you.